All right, as people are still filtering in, we'll go ahead and do a little housekeeping background pieces here. So we're waiting for a few more people to log on and get set up. Uh, my name is Amanda Gangwish. I am the program director here at Conservation Nebraska, and I oversee our AmeriCorps Common Ground Program, which is helping organize and host this event tonight. Uh, Rita Thomas, one of our AmeriCorps members, helped pull all of this together, and you will get to meet her a little bit later on in the evening. Uh, for right now, just giving you guys a little heads up background as you're settling in. Your videos are turned off and you are muted. Uh, it's part of our webinar design. So no worries if you're eating dinner, finishing up a snack, sitting in your PJs at home. No one can see you. We can't hear you. So everything's good there. Does mean if you have any questions for our panelists, feel free to drop those either in the chat or there's a Q&A function for you. Our plan for tonight is to have Sarah present and then have Dr. K present, and then we'll answer all of your questions at the end. So feel free to drop the questions in at any point as you get them, but we're going to go ahead and hold off and save those until the end of the presentations. So a little background on our presenters who are thrilled to have here. Uh, Sarah Bailey, who will be going first, has been with Prairie Plains Resource Institute for over 10 years, where she is a naturalist educator, prairie ecologist, and manager of, of the greenhouse. She works with many aspects of the Prairie Plains restoration program, whether it's harvesting seeds, helping design high diversity seed mixes for restoration projects, or growing out native plant plugs. Sarah has also developed educational opportunities to actively engage high school students and educators in ecological restoration work. Sarah is the creator and coordinator of two youth education programs at Prairie Plains, the Youth Naturalist Program and Young Nebraska Ecologists. In recent years, Sarah has been making connections with local universities and colleges and has begun collaborating on research efforts that bring faculty and students out to Prairie Plains preserves and restored sites to study prairie management and ecological restoration efforts. So Sarah, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you for your presentation, and then we'll introduce Dr. K the second time around for hers. All right, thank you very much. And thanks for inviting us uh, to uh, Conservation Nebraska presentation here. Um, can everybody, can you see the screen here that I'm sharing just to make sure? Okay, great. Um, so at, um, most of you probably know uh, that grasslands are some of the most underprotected ecosystems in the world. Um, and it, we've made it our mission at Prairie Plains uh, to work on restoring and protecting these wild places. And we also invite you out to the prairie for educational and outdoor experiences so we can all work together to leave the world more wild than we found it. And so Prairie Plains, just a little background here, Prairie Plains is a nonprofit organization founded in 1980, and we are based out of Aurora, Nebraska. Um, we have eight different education, or we're a land trust that has eight different educational land, uh, educational lands around the state of Nebraska, um, different prairie preserves. And Prairie Plains has led the way for high diversity and local ecotype prairie and wetland restoration work in Nebraska. Um, this began kind of um, at the end of the 1970s and into the early 80s when uh, founder and uh, longtime executive director Bill Whitney um, he had visited some sites in Wisconsin and Illinois uh, to see the restoration work being done in some of those areas and brought that back to Nebraska with a lot of ideas of, of how that could be done here. And so uh, in the early 80s, he set out looking at native plant communities that still remained here in Nebraska and um, just started collecting seed and then worked to uh, slowly begin restoring small areas um, to see how it works here in Nebraska. And so I'll get more into restoration work here as we go on, um, but Prairie Plains also spe specializes in grassland management and natural education on our network of prairie preserves around the state. So I wanted to give just a little background or context for prairies in general before we get uh, kind of going into restoration and, and some of the issues with uh, grassland management and conservation today. And uh, many of you are probably familiar with uh, the different ecoregions in Nebraska and the types of prairie that we have here. Um, that map on the bottom shows those different regions. And so we have different types of prairie throughout the state of Nebraska. And um, grasslands are, of course, dominated by grasses and herbaceous plants. Um, and of course have very few to typically no trees present, um, at least historically. And so these prairies are largely driven by climate 
and rainfall and other natural disturbances like grazing and fire. So if you think historically back to bison grazing across the Great Plains and also um, wildfires being uh, present there and also even some of the Great Plains tribes that would use fire uh, to control where bison were moving. Um, and so these, these drivers of change across grasslands um, the, the plants and the other life on the prairie are, have truly adapted and evolved under those pressures over time. So just a real quick run through uh, on, on the prairie ecosystem. Um, but prairies are amazing and diverse and beautiful places to visit. Um, they really beg looking or giving it a closer look um, because they of course are not just grasses. There's many different species of wildflowers that you'll find out on the prairie and many different uh, animals out there as well and insect pollinators. And so this just shows a few examples of, of prairie and also uh, the organisms and plants that inhabit the prairie. And so they're truly amazing and diverse ecosystems. And just to drive that point home, um, some of you may know uh, or have heard of Chris Helzer with the Nature Conservancy. He did a great project at a restored prairie site just outside of Aurora, the town of Aurora. And uh, that was at Lincoln Creek. And he looked at um, just one square meter of prairie for an entire year. So he started in January of 2018 um, and visited that plot throughout that whole year, photographing whatever he could find within that square meter. And in the end, um, he found that there were 110 species at least that he could record during his times while he visited that plot. So if you think of how sm you know, small a square meter is, um, that really drives the point home of just how diverse uh, prairie ecosystems or restoration sites can be. Um, so there are vibrant and dynamic ecological communities that have complex interactions between many different plants and, and other organisms. And so this just shows quickly in pictures, just how diverse um, some of the, you know, the things he was finding there. A lot of these are, of course, plants and insects. Uh, if you think about also the other uh, animals that came and went from those sites, like grassland birds um, and mammals and things like that, that he might not, not have seen at that time, um, that number would be higher than 110. So um, there's some issues though with habitat loss, especially within the eastern third of Nebraska. Um, so if, if you take a look at this map of land cover types in the state of Nebraska, um, you'll see that that eastern, about the eastern third of Nebraska shows a lot of area that's been converted to agriculture. And of course we need agriculture. Uh, we depend on, on the food and the um, economy here in Nebraska. So that's important, but um, we're really missing a lot of ecosystem services that we once had in this region um, and working to um, kind of create a balance between agriculture and um, restoration work and prairie management work is going to become even more important uh, throughout that whole region of Nebraska. And, and considering the tall grass prairie region, um, you know, a lot of the numbers are around maybe about one to 2% of tall grass prairie that remains kind of depending on where you're at. Sometimes that's a little more, um, say in the Flint Hills uh, or in the Southeast corner of Nebraska, or uh, it could be less, uh, less than 1% if you move further east into areas of Iowa. Um, so really hardly any native prairie remains. And so that becomes an issue uh, because habitat becomes degraded over time across certain areas, meaning that uh, you can see uh, loss in species diversity, both in the plant and animal communities in those areas, and also fragmentation of those different sites can become an issue uh, when you think about genetic diversity and um, being able to have gene flow across uh, the ecosystem. And so ecologists uh, in, in many recent years here have been reporting major uh, population declines for a number of different species, um, animals like native bees, monarchs, and other butterflies, grassland birds, and others as well. And one of the biggest threats across uh, most of the grassland types in the state of Nebraska now um, is actually the encroachment by eastern red cedars and uh, other deciduous trees. 
And so not even in the tall grass prairie region, if you look uh, even into the mixed grass uh, areas of central Nebraska and even into the sand hills, uh, we're starting to see major issues with, with tree encroachment, especially with the eastern red cedar, um, which you probably noticed before across the landscape. And though that's actually a native tree, um, the eastern red cedar, it's creating a lot of problems because it is growing very rapidly across areas of grasslands and bluffs um, where it's choking out native prairie plant communities. And so um, there's a lot of human impact involved in that um, on the landscape. And there's a lot of changes that have happened over time. So if you think about fire suppression, um, where wildfires or uh, prescribed fires aren't being uh, used in areas, those cedar trees and other woody growth is going to survive and thrive. Um, if you also think about planting of trees for um, specific types of trees for shelter belts, um, and then the spread of other non-native plants, uh, we can have quite an impact on, on the landscape, especially over time. Um, and climate change is now a major threat to that continued aggressive growth of, of these woody plants. So something we have to be looking out for in the future as well. Uh, but there is definitely hope uh, for our ecosystem here in Nebraska, especially the tall grass ecosystem that we're working in in the eastern part of Nebraska. And that hope is prairie restoration and proper management. Um, and that is the key essentially to reversing negative impacts on the ecosystem. And so that can come in a few different forms. Um, the first being, which is what I'll touch on mostly today, is the reconstruction of native plant communities, um, both prairie and wetland here in Nebraska, on marginal farmland. And so that's totally starting, you know, essentially from scratch, uh, because on, on the farmland, of course, you're not going to have any remnant, um, you know, native plant species remaining. So that area is going to either be planted or broadcast seeded. Uh, with a lot of different types of native plants and grasses. And uh, the work then is to establish those native plant communities over time in those areas. Um, other restoration and restorative activities are tree and shrub removal on native prairie and pasture uh, to help heal the landscape and allow the prairie to come back into those areas that they've encroached on. Um, this can also be done through reintroducing fire or prescribed fire. Um, also implementation of responsible grazing practices and a very key component is also education. Um, so educating as we go and, and helping folks learn more about this and understand um, and working with the younger generation too to see what's possible uh, looking into the future with restoration and, and our ecosystems here in Nebraska. Um, so now to get more into the kind of the nitty gritty of, of prairie plains and how we uh, do prairie and wetland restoration here in Nebraska. And this just gives you an idea of the restoration cycle, first of all, um, throughout the whole year. And so um, we're constantly working and, and planning for different stages along the way during, during an entire year. And so, of course, we have to harvest a lot of native seed uh, to be able to do, do this work. And so that happens from about May through October as the plants bloom all different times throughout the season. The seed is ready, of course, at all different times. And so we're out to harvest that seed over a pretty long period of time. Um, also during that same time, we are setting out that seed for drying um, on a, bar, a big barn floor. You'll see some pictures of that. Uh, and so we just ensure that the seed material dries and then that it's prepared for processing. And so uh, we'll process that seed to break up the, the plant material, allow the seed to drop out. And by the time November rolls around, we're doing a lot of that processing. And then after that point, then assembling our mixes uh, for specific sites. And I'll get more into the details on that here soon. Uh, we also do um, some testing on that seed, some general testing, TZ testing, um, for germination rate on that um, before planting. And then December through May, um, we're making site-specific um, seed mixes and then going out and doing that planting work. Um, and then in the spring, we're finishing up with the planting and then also thinking about the next season. That can mean prescribed burning um, for grass harvest and just planting out um, some of the, the restoration season in general. 
And so this is what the work looks like um, for the hand harvesting of a lot of different species of uh, forbs or, or broadleaf wildflower plants. Uh, we head out with five gallon buckets, two gallon buckets um, and strap those on with a little carabiner on our belt loop. And so we have our hands free um, and then we're just cutting off the seed heads and uh, putting those into the buckets. And so we're out in the field, we're doing that either on remnant prairie sites or even restored sites that we've worked on. Um, and then also a big component of that is from county roadside ditches uh, where there's still native plant communities that remain. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that too as we go on here. But so that's what harvest looks like. The seed diversity is really incredible. Um, we're harvesting anything from milkweeds to asters to blazing stars, um, sunflowers, um, other minor grasses and sedges, um, prairie roses. So there's a huge diversity of seed um, that goes through our hands as we collect throughout the season. And in a given season, we're actually collecting um, anywhere from about 225 up to possibly even 240 to 250 species. Um, in a given year for restoration work. And so our restoration ecologist, Mike Bullerman, he has done a wonderful job over the years of taking waypoints across um, many different counties in central and eastern Nebraska. Um, and so these waypoints are largely on county roadsides um, where we will find native plant populations that still exist uh, in those areas and we can mark them by GPS um, while they're flowering, typically when it's easy to find them. And then we're able to come back later and harvest from those areas um, with a lot of ease. And so this is what it looks like in the truck um, with our mobile GIS system. So those get displayed, those waypoints uh, for the plants get displayed on the map and we can drive directly to those points uh, to get out and harvest. And so this is what the seed barn then looked look like um, kind of later on in the season, late summer or early fall. And so we have a ton of plant material drying on the floor of many different species. And by the time September, later September rolls around, we also have to uh, combine harvest grass seeds. So the major grasses like the blue stem and Indian grass and switchgrass, uh, we have to get a large quantity of that uh, into our mixes. And so we actually use some small, uh, older, gleaner combines uh, that work really well for the grass harvest. And then once later fall rolls around into November and December, um, you know, all that seed gets processed through at the hammer mill. That's actually shown in the upper right picture there. So we're just uh, hammer milling that to break the uh, seed or the plant material up to get the seed out. Uh, we don't actually clean uh, the seed at all, but make our mixes with all that um, extra inert plant material uh, in the mixes. And so um, when we're mixing for a particular site, um, we're then taking four mix or the hand harvested mix uh, and then mixing that in with specific rates of grass um, for particular planting. So uh, when we make our seed mixes, uh, we make them for different sites based on what that site is like. Um, so Mike is able to go in and look at soils data and LIDAR data uh, to show kind of both the topography and, and what the soil type is at these sites. And then we can specifically target uh, what species uh, go on particular sites. And so we um, largely work with larger restoration projects both uh, through the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, so like the Wetland Reserves Program uh, is one of them. And also with private landowners and the other agencies um, that are doing restoration on their lands as well. Um, so we can tailor these different mixes to the specific site then. Uh, so we'll make a wetland mix, um, you know, a more emergent mix with a few species uh, that go in almost, you know, standing water. Um, we'll create mixes that go kind of on an in-between um, sort of mesic prairie site where it's a wetter prairie, um, but not truly an upland site. Uh, we make an upland seed mix and then also um, seed mixes for sand. And then we can custom make 
seed mixes to go specifically to other sites like in eastern Nebraska, uh, where you see only particular species um, on that eastern edge of Nebraska, we can add those in um, for specific sites there. So we get pretty specific um, on where the seed gets applied so that we can have the best results, um, you know, knowing where these plants will thrive and do the best. And so this is what the planting process looks like. And so we, uh, we like to say it's a mix of old and new technology. Uh, so we're using GIS and GPS um, to do the work to, to figure out where we're planting what seed mixes um, and also to track you know, how we're planting across the site um, so we don't overlap any areas. Um, so that's the new technology. The old technology is just broadcasting the seed uh, with an old 1950s easy flow fertilizer spreader. Um, so we broadcast seed um, at these restoration sites. The planting conditions can differ. Some of the upland sites might be uh, corn or soybean stubble at the time. So right after they had been planted for their last season and then taken out of production. Um, and then we can plant sometimes straight into that. Other sites will require more um, like with the wetland reserves program uh, where we're, you know, planting different areas that have been excavated um, to hold standing water or to recreate slough channels and things like that. So um, the planting conditions can differ quite a bit. Um, and overall, since, um, you know, right when I had mentioned Bill, Bill Whitney had gotten started kind of the late 70s and into the early 80s, so since 1979, um, Prairie Plains has restored over 13,300 acres, uh, mostly in central and eastern Nebraska. And just some important thoughts then here on the ecological restoration that we do. Um, so we, the type of restoration work um, or our sort of niche in Nebraska is to do high diversity and local ecotype uh, prairie and wetland restoration. And so essentially what that means, the high diversity is that our seed mixes are gonna contain anywhere from say about a hundred species to somewhere even, you know, if we're blending some of those mixes, sometimes even up to 200 species that get applied to a particular site. Um, the term local ecotype means that we're harvesting the seed, uh, the seed or the source of the seed is from these regions in Nebraska. So we're actually harvesting seed in central and eastern Nebraska and applying those seed mixes back on the ground in those same areas. Um, that becomes important because those uh, seed sources are adapted uh, to these specific climates in Nebraska. And so, um, you know, with that high diversity and local ecotype restoration work is excellent pollinator habitat. Um, because we're providing a large diversity of wildflowers, uh, native plants in those mixes, that they can then in turn be used by um, you know, a large number of insect pollinators that are gonna become attracted to those sites and sort of recolonize those areas. Um, the high diversity and local ecotype mixes are uniquely suited to the hydrologic regimes uh, within a specific area. So I kind of already touched on that where we're applying um, specific mixes to specific sites. Um, so we might have um, say well in reserve program project where we're gonna have wetland sites, uh, maybe some mesic sites and even maybe a little bit of upland. And so um, we're tailoring them to specific areas. And because of that, then the resulting plant communities have then the ability to withstand, you know, major stochastic events such as flooding and drought. Um, those species are going to um, survive different conditions if there are lots of different species that do well in different um, conditions. When we revisit some of these sites, um, depending on the year, we're gonna see a lot of differences within the plant communities um, based on you know, moisture and, and rainfall and, and what's happening. Um, and so the more diversity you can apply to those sites, uh, the better those plant communities are gonna do overall. Um, and then also local ecotype seed ensures the preservation of Nebraska's natural botanical heritage as well. And so just a few pictures here to show the development at some of these restoration sites. Um, so it's really exciting to go back then and see these planting sites, you know, five, 10 years 
after they were planted and see how these native plants um, have really come into those areas and started to recreate these, these native sort of plant communities. Um, of course, then they start drawing in a lot of the insect uh, pollinators and insects that will come into those areas, which then of course in turn, bring, in turn brings um, a lot of other native wildlife like grassland birds um, back into these areas. So it's an exciting process to watch and takes a, definitely a few years, around three to five years to really um, see a site establish and start looking kind of like a native prairie habitat. Um, but it's a really exciting process to watch. And again, we're not trying to, you know, recreate every bit, um, you know, of the native ecosystem. It's impossible to, you know, completely recreate a native prairie. Um, but what we're trying to do is, is our best attempt to get the species right and create areas that function ecologically um, from that perspective and provide important ecosystem services. Just, and I just want to make a note quickly that management is very important um, across a lot of these per, these restored sites and native prairie sites. Um, you know, I, I don't have a lot of time to touch on this, so I welcome any questions later or if anybody wants to get in contact uh, with Prairie Plains uh, after the event on this. Um, we'd be happy to talk about management as well. So um, all the things listed here are very important when managing a, a restored or native prairie site. Uh, we also have the greenhouse that's given us the ability to grow out a lot of native plant plugs um, for specific restoration sites. And so um, we've concentrated on a handful of species um, as well as you know other important pollinator uh, native forbs. Uh, that are going to go well into these restoration sites. And so each year we grow anywhere from about 90 to 100 species in the greenhouse. Um, I currently have about the capacity to do 5,000 to 6,000 plugs each year. And these plugs are uh, used or plugged into these high diversity restoration projects. Um, sometimes, you know, partner organizations or with educational programs. Um, and also we've provided some for um, pollinator, pollinator or native plant gardens as well. And so the focus is basically on growing species that are less common or that might establish slower in restoration sites or might not establish at all in restoration sites because um, you know their seed source is, is, it's hard to find a seed source essentially for, for certain species because they are less common. Um, and then also ones that have a higher pollinator value as well. Uh, we've also found that the greenhouse is an exceptional teaching tool, um, which I'll, I'll touch on here briefly in a minute. And then we've also um, been able to concentrate heavily on prairie violet um, and also other native violet um, production in the greenhouse. It's been a high priority for us because of uh, regal fritillary butterfly conservation work. Um, so the prairie violet is the host plant for the larval stage um, for the regal fritillary, a butterfly of great concern um, here in Nebraska and actually across its entire region. Um, and so we're excited to have begun that work uh, with a number of partner organizations over the past few years. Um, and then plugs may also play an important role in enhancing early season uh, forbs, which are again, you know, hard to find uh, a lot of seed for. And so a lot of the early season blooming plants, um, you know, are usually absent um, largely from most restoration sites. So um, trying to now concentrate efforts to grow out plugs um, for some of those early season plants and getting them into the restoration sites. Um, so just very briefly, um, what I mentioned, we're really excited about this project um, and growing these native violets uh, for Regal Frillary um, conservation work. And uh, one example of that is working with the Prairie Corridor, which is a, a project um, through the city of Lincoln, um, also with UNL and Spring Creek Prairie and some of their partner organizations. Um, and so the Prairie Corridor extends 
um, from Spring Creek Prairie uh, near the town of Denton all the way next to Denton and then um, up to Pioneers Park. And so um, they're creating an awesome uh, hiking area, a uh, corridor where you can hike or bike um, and get out and see prairie areas. Um, and also with the goal of, of restoring a lot of these areas and enhancing them um, for conservation as well. And so um, the past couple years, we've been planting at a couple different sites, both Denton Prairie, a restoration site uh, near the town of Denton, and then also at Pioneers Park um, to enhance these areas with, that don't have um, you know, prairie violets, either due to the restoration work uh, or the fact that you know, they've degraded over time in these native prairie sites. Um, we're plugging those in, in hopes that um, they will do well and then uh, provide more habitat for regal fritillary butterflies to move into and then across that, that corridor. Um, and so just yesterday, uh, we went out also too to start a project uh, with UNL where, where we are going to track kind of the survivorship essentially of uh, these prairie violets that have been plugged in to some of the sites. And so the white flags show the prairie violets that are coming back from last year's plug planting. And so uh, Dave Wadeen and some students at UNL are gonna be looking at um, how those violets survive over time. And then are they creating new, um, you, you know, new young violet plants in those areas and are they spreading? over time. And then later on that can then be paired with um, regal fritillary butterfly surveys uh, to see if they're potentially increasing maybe in some of those areas or not. Um, so we're excited to see where that goes. And just briefly here, I think I need to uh, wrap it up here. Um, we also have a few or a couple of projects with high school greenhouse classes in the area, one being with Boone Central uh, greenhouse class out of Albion. And so these students are getting the chance to learn about and participate in uh, prairie restoration in the process itself. And so we will go out uh, with the students and they'll get a chance to um, get some education about um, prairie ecosystems, about restoration, um, how to grow out native plants, and then in their own school greenhouse um, using native seed that we've harvested with them. Um, and then some that we've, we've also harvested throughout the year uh, to then grow out native plant plugs that then in the spring, we're able to go out with the class and plant um, across some areas at uh, some of our preserves that we're working on, um, some areas that we're working on restoring. And so uh, one example of that is at our Olson Nature Preserve. And so this is up north of Albion. We have a lowland prairie area along Beaver Creek um, that needs enhancement because of degradation over time. Um, there's a lot of cool season, non-native grass in there, um, smooth brome, uh, and some other things that we want to address there. And so we want to increase diversity by overseeding that area with, with native um, seed mixes, and then also go in with the plugs that students have grown um, and then enhance that area even further by adding more diversity uh, than with those plugs. And so that's been going for a couple years now. And we're really excited um, about that process and, and being able to uh, teach, you know, younger generations um, kind of about the restoration process and, and the importance of the work. So um, to wrap things up, I just want to invite everybody out um, to our prairie preserves. Um, please come visit us, Gerlach Prairie. Um, we're finishing up our um, amazing education center very soon. Um, so that's the barn shown in the upper left photo there. Um, Gerlach Prairie is also an incredible bluff prairie that borders the Platte River in Hamilton County. Um, so please don't hesitate to visit us. Um, I don't have a lot of time to talk about uh, education and, and some of the other things that we do on these prairie preserves, um, but feel free to get in touch with us. There are also other prairie preserves um, owned and managed by Prairie Plains that you can visit around the state of Nebraska as well. Um, and all of this information is on our website, prairieplains.org. Um, and so I just encourage you to reach out to us then with any questions and I'll turn it over from here. So.
Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate it. Well, while Kay is getting set up, just as a reminder for all of our attendees here, we're going to save all of the questions until the end of Kay's presentation. So some of you have already started, but if you have any questions, whether they're for Sarah, Kay, or both, uh, feel free to either drop those in the chat or the Q&A section, and we will get to those after Kay's presentation here. So Dr. Kay, while you're getting set up, I'm going to go ahead and introduce you. So Dr. Kate Hodes is a prairie ecologist, botanist, horticulturist, and former instructor of North American Native Plains Horticulture and Botany at UNL in Nebraska Westland. As president of Prairie Legacy, Kay travels the state doing environmental surveys and providing restoration consult consulting. Kay is the chair of the Nebraska Seed and Plant Producers, an organization created to support and increase knowledge of and availability of the local ecotype plant material in Nebraska. In 2010, Kay purchased the family farm, founded Wits, home, at Wits End Homestead, and began to transition the 160-year-old traditional farm into local equal type seed and plant production. Prairie Legacy makes these available online. Today, home is on the prairie, and Kay is helping others to restore, preserve, and understand the prairie in new ways. So with that, Kay, I will hand it off to you. You should be able to share whatever presentation you would like um, and take it away for us. Okay, so hopefully you can see the screen there. I think so. So um, if you can hear me all right, um, just a quick introduction of how we came to be working with prairie restoration. Um, so in my time as an instructor at UNL, I became aware of the uh, need for private contractors to do environmental survey work um, from endangered species to habitat delineation of threatened and endangered species. So if I can go back there. So um, we've done surveys of the uh, Nebraska's only native endangered species, um, the only threatened um, species in Nebraska. And land managers and restorationists need to know if their methods are producing the desired results. So taking plot data and analyzing the results to compare um, one site from year to year uh, helps them to decide what their management practices are accomplishing. Um, in turn, this work made me increasingly aware of the need for local ecotype seed for restorations such as this one. To that end, I purchased the family farm in 2010 and started cleaning it up. To remember that famous quote from 2016, I inherited a mess. I purchased mine. This is what the availability of land meant to some of our ancestors, and this is what it's been used for. So we began putting into practice some of the management goals and procedures that we have recommended of others, such as removing the trees, doing prescribed burns. This is some data that we took from before and after our tree removal at the farm. So this was native prairie, but had been overgrown with cedars and uh, honey locust. And that's the sort of thing, you know, that Sarah mentioned um, that happens when remnant prairies get um, scattered and divided by highways and the um, the natural fire that used to come through no longer comes through so you have to recreate that but it has to have some human help so this is what my prairie looked like that in the background when we purchased it and then we've removed all of those trees and started that uh, manage the management goals that have helped it turn into a very nice prairie now. Um, and so now we're able to collect seed from these remnant prairies 
and we call that zero generation seed. So in other words, it's, it's um, local ecotype seed that's been collected from a remnant prairie. And then we have uh, been able to move those into the greenhouse uh, transplants, um, grow transplants in the greenhouse. And we transplant those into seed plots. Um, this is a little bit of different practice than, than what Prairie Plains does. They um, get their seed directly from um, the remnant prairies and the restored prairies, but we're kind of doing what you might call a restored prairie in plot form. And so what we're doing is we're growing these out um, to get first generation seed from that zero generation seed we collected. So there's more transplanting. So we grow those uh, into the seed plots, see several seed plots, and we of course have to do some weeding in those plots and it's exhausting. But we are able to increase the seed in those plots and um, always keep first and second generation seed and the restorations that we're able to help with. So to collect from those seed plots, we use a wide variety of tools and equipment from hand collecting. We're hand collecting a compass plant here. We use organza bags to collect seed that would fly away if we um, didn't have something to capture it. We use vacuums. There's a huge vacuum that we use that's great on asters. We use the um, we use the hedge trimmers. Oh, you can actually, that's kind of sideways. <laughs> but we use those. Um, and we use hedge trimmers on a cart. There's another picture of that cart. And there's me using the cart. So um, we've also used um, combines, similar to what um, Sarah has mentioned that they use. And all that collecting is exhausting too. We also dry our seed, as she mentioned, on tarps, but we have uh, built a few bins where we can um, take and dry the harvested seed with fans. And then we use a, a many varieties of cleaning the seed. And this is something that Sarah mentioned that they um, don't do specifically, but what we do to break up the seed is um, we'll do the grape stomp. Uh, we use a hammer mill as well. Uh, we have fanning mills, old fanning mills, new fanning mills, um, a variety of other pieces of equipment. And we use small fanning mills. We start with something like this and we run it through this small fanning mill and it will separate the large pieces going off the top, small pieces going outside, and then you get the clean seed in the bottom. Oops. See, I can stop that. It just wants to keep going. <laughs> okay, there we go. And so um, we store the seed in, in environmentally controlled conditions. We have a cold room and then a place where we can test um, all of our seed for germination as required by state law. Um, there's a, a little picture of our germinating seed we're testing. And then we also put seed together in seed mixes and we're able to measure exactly, you know, what, what we need to put into these mixes. Um, so when we remix these seed, we sell it either as a mix or as an individual packets, but cleaning is a way for us to be able to use a different type, a different method for restoring prairie. And that is using a seed drill. 
So you have to have very clean seed to get it through a seed drill um, rather than the, the sorts of spreaders that you would use to broadcast. But you can also, of course, broadcast um, clean seed. So that's the sort of thing that was used to restore this prairie. So why do we go to all this trouble? Um, it's good. So we want to get some good pollinator plantings. Um, but in the U.S., we're losing 30 soccer fields of soil every minute. Um, and this is, this is actually um, a spot on my uh, farm that we purchased. Um, and so we had, we had a big mess to clean up there. So we're destroying biodiversity at our homes and in our fields. And we're still plowing up land for crop production or ethanol production or, you know, many other like um, feeding cattle. There's not enough grassland left. Like Sarah mentioned, there's only one to 2% of tall grass prairie remaining. So what do we do? We turn some more prairies into feedlots. So our appetites from the food we eat to the shiny things in our driveways is really unsustainable. Um, we, you've heard that money makes the world go around. It's true, but it also makes the world less diverse. So our use of natural resources in the US is unsustainable. Each person consumes an equivalent of 20 acres of land every year in what we actually consume. So the result is a loss of biodiversity, desertification, global warming. Biodiversity is ultimately what fights climate change and what keeps our world sustainable. Right now we have only 4% of the animal species are wild. The other 96% of our animal species are domestic animals. So we've placed ourselves in the middle of a dangerous situation that needs immediate rectification. But there's still hope. And here we go. Another one doesn't want to quit. So if you're wondering what keeps me motivated every day, it's this guy, because if we remain on this path, when this young man is my age, there will be no more pollinators. Because tall grass prairie is the heart, the lungs, the kidneys of everything that we live for, all of our resources, our food and our shelter. And not many people really realize this. Um, the plants, the trees that feed the insects, the pollinators, um, those in turn feed the birds and so on. And each region of earth is its own ecosystem and each of those ecosystems work in tandem. Even urban areas need to return the biodiversity in the form of restored urban prairie systems. Because we have forced the natural world to live within our boundaries instead of living within the boundaries of the natural world. If those of you who have read Doug Tallamy understand a little bit of what I'm talking about, they've done some research that finds that these native birds that now are forced to live within the urban landscapes really require that you have at least a third of your landscape in native plants and not just native but local ecotype plants. And the reason is something that Sarah touched on and that is that the native insects that they feed their young um, only can survive on native plants that they have evolved with. And so if we have nothing but European or exotic species in our landscapes, these populations will die, they're dwindling and they cannot sustain themselves. So it's important to understand that even though we're talking about a prairie ecosystem, which seems so far removed from an urban system. It's really important that you understand that even if you live in an urban area, you have a responsibility to help restore some of that where you live. Earth stewardship is not the responsibility of a few specialists. It's the inherent responsibility of every human being, no matter where you live.
So start with your ecoregion. In your ecoregion, the tall grass prairie, put back as much diversity as you can, um, wherever you can. So Nebraska's tall grass prairie has a lot of diversity. And even if you don't want a wild landscape in your yard, um, you can certainly put back some very beautiful species um, in an organized way, if you wish, but it's going to require that um, for biodiversity to return. It's got to be in the urban areas as well as in the Tallgrass Prairie ecosystem where it was. So Sarah and I are here to help you find plants for your landscape and, and seeds for your small or large prairie restoration or to give advice on how to do it, but it's up to you. And so that's my presentation. I hope I made up some time. <laughs> So if you need, you know, um, any questions answered about what might work in an urban area or in a rural area, um, I'm certainly willing to talk with anyone and you can visit our Facebook page or our website um, to find out more. I think our moderator gone. <laughs> can you hear me, Sarah and Kay? I yes. can now, I think, yes. Okay, I just wanted to tell you both thank you very much um, for speaking. Great informative presentation. Um, I'm not sure, Amanda, did you have more that you'd like to add to this before we do the question and answer? Nope, I would just say hop into those questions and answers so we can get as many answered as we can before we're done here for the night. Okay, um, so I really hope that I uh, don't butcher anyone's name. If I do, I apologize in advance. I'll try to get to as many of these questions as I can. And I wanted to thank the audience also. Um, so the first question we have um, is from Grace. And um, she wants to know, have the tribes been consulted and invited to help in the restoration process? Um, she says, tribes have an incredible wealth of knowledge of the ecosystem of the prairie. And, and either of you uh, could answer that question. I think it came uh, during Sarah's presentation. Um, yeah, that, that is a fantastic question. Um, and I've, I've heard some great examples of that taking place with restoration work in other parts of the country. Um, unfortunately, we haven't, um, you know, up until now had a great chance uh, to do that. Um, but as far as, as looking forward, um, we are very excited about um, a new contact with the Pawnee tribe. Um, and having a connection through um, Central Community College in Hastings uh, there. And so um, there's somebody there that's working on, um, basically working on a national curriculum uh, to bring, bring together some of the tribes of Nebraska, including the Pawnee, um, to create a curriculum based on, um, you know, a lot of different information about the tribe, um, including, you know, ecological information as well. And so um, I think looking next year and in, into the future, um, we may be able to bring um, some folks out to spe specifically from the Pawnee tribe and possibly some other tribes um, like Omaha uh, out to Gerloff Prairie. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited for that potential looking forward, but um, you know, we, we haven't worked directly with anybody in the past. So. Okay, uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, Pam would like to know, how long does it take to establish a native prairie on average? Um, so our general rule of thumb is, you know, for it's about three to five years to really start to see a lot of growth from those native plants where you're going to um, see that area looking a little more like uh, a native prairie type ecosystem. Um, but that establishment takes place over a much longer period of time. Um, so what you see, you know, in that first three to five years coming in, um, a number of those plants are kind of going to be what we would consider an early successional um, species, you know, so there's things like uh, Canada milk vetch, 
um, Canada wild rye grass. Um, so those are just two examples of, of things you would see really early on in a restoration site. Um, they tend to thrive a little better in some disturbance type areas, um, along with some of the annual weeds like annual sunflowers that come in. Um, but then as you get further down the road after five to 10 years, uh, you're gonna start to see, you know, other species colonize that you might not have seen within say the first four or five years of that um, restoration site. So the establishment takes a, you know, place over a long period of time. Um, but in order to start to see, you know, what people would call results, um, to see it look like more of a native plant community, it's typically for our, our work, maybe around three to five years. Kay, do you want to add? Yeah, on? yeah, that's the general rule of thumb. Um, and what we instruct people is that um, that's what it takes. Um, we do sometimes put together um, seed mixes that um, have mostly species that will germinate within the first couple of years. And so some of those um, can start to look like something a little bit earlier. The photo that I showed in my presentation of a restoration, that was a uh, year three on that particular restoration. And that had been a field, um, like a soybean field prior to that. And it depends a little bit on what you started with. And again, it also depends on how you, uh, how and when um, you start that process. And then of course, of course it, it depends a little bit on management. And we found that if you do a little bit of management and mow down weeds um, for the first couple of years, then um, you'll get a better looking prairie the third year. Um, that particular one that I showed you um, was an exception to that. It had never been mowed or anything done to it. And what we had done in that particular restoration was to include some species, a lot of those species that were um, early germinating. So they didn't have quite as, as long of a dormancy period. And so that was able to, to cover and he got a pretty good pollinator planting out of that one. So yeah, the, the answer to that question is it depends and have patience. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have another question from Dwayne, and uh, can you briefly comment on what is considered responsible grazing? That is a, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of uh, spectrum there, I guess, and it totally depends on the size of the site, um, what is there, if it's more mixed grass, if it's, you know, eastern tall grass prairie. Um, so really, it, honestly, that question is really going to be kind of a case by case basis on on what the site is actually like. Um, a, you know, some general thoughts about grazing are that, um, you know, you don't want to do the same thing every single year. Um, so you wouldn't want to have cattle in one area grazing really hard, um, you know, across that area for a large part of the season. And then the next year come in and do the same thing and they're going to keep hitting that area really hard. Um, you know, if you have the freedom to, you know, break up a few different areas across the site, um, either control that through um, some fencing or even if possible burning uh, to attract them to, to different areas. Um, and so what you want to do with that grazing is, is get them into different areas and, and grazing at different times um, in different seasons. Uh, to kind of change that up. So um, with grazing, what we're looking at doing with our management is creating different types of habitat patches uh, throughout our prairies. And so creating those different types of habitat where you have, you know, a little more heav heavily grazed areas uh, where there's a lot of openings. Um, you have some areas that are going to be maybe mid height um, of, of grasses and, and plants in there. And then you have some areas that are going to be mostly ungrazed. Um, you know, those types of habitat structures are, are really going to provide the best opportunities for both native plants and other organisms that are, that are going to come into those sites that have different habitat needs. 
Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. I think we're going to move on now to the Q&A, um, maybe answer a few more questions. We are sort of running low on time. You can always contact Sarah and Kay um, through their organizations, and I'm sure they'll be happy to um, talk with you and give you some answers there. Um, so now on the Q&A, we have a question from Mel. Can original prairie seeds remain viable on prairie land that has been farmed for decades and then taken out of production? How long can seed remain viable? That's an interesting question. Um, and, it and the answer there is, again, it depends. It depends on the species. It depends on the dormancy factors involved. It depends on how deep the seed is. Um, so the longer that you... Um, the longer that you cultivate an area, uh, the, the further you are from, from having chances of getting native species back in that spot. Um, that said, I mean, I have an example of a CRP planting that um, actually was planted to um, all non-native grass species, but it's now got 40 um, species of native plants and it's uh, far more native than it is non-native. So the natives not only came back, but they persevered. Um, it doesn't have that much brome in it. If it were brome, I don't think it would have had a chance, but um, yeah, so many species will stay dormant for you know 20 years. Um, but that's not going to happen if your ground is full of chemicals and cultivated frequently. And um, so my, my thought is um, the best results you're going to get is if you can get that back into native production, you know, within about three years or so. But after that, um, it's, it gets difficult to um, to get the natives back. Is that what you were finding, Sarah? Or if, if you're yeah. talking about go back acres rather than, than planting it, sorry. Right, that can be pretty tricky, I think, in, depending on the situation in, from cropland. Um, I guess what I'll add to that is, is just um, an interesting note from actually removal of, of Eastern red cedar from the bluff prairies uh, that we have here in Hamilton County. And it's, it's amazing what came back in some of those areas after, you know, say 40 to 50 years even um, of cedar encroachment. And, you know, we didn't do overseeding in a lot of those areas uh, or anything like that. We just, you know, cut cedars, uh, started our rotation of, of burning um, and grazing management in some of those areas um, and let it heal over time. And, um, you know, kind of like a, a restored site from cropland, you know, you had a lot of annual weeds kind of colonize early on first few years, but um, over time now looking, let's see, probably uh, 10, 15 years um, past removal on a lot of those areas, um, some of those plant communities that came back are incredible. You know, we have downy gentian um, in some of those areas. So it makes me think that the seed bank um, what still remained in some of those sites. I know that's obviously different than, than cropland, but um, you know, I, I thought it was really hopeful when thinking about restoring from, from woody tree encroachment that there's a lot that's possible um, in kind of a native landscape already, so. Thank you both. Um, and a question from Dylan, um, do fertility, fertilities feed on other violet species? Um, yes, so uh, they'd feed on a, a few different species of violets in our region of Nebraska, um, primarily in, in upland prairies. They feed on the um, prairie violet or viola pedatipida. Um, in lower sites like uh, Platte River Meadows um, or other low prairies, uh, you would probably find them eating uh, uh, viola missouriensis or viola um, sororia. Um, and there's maybe a few others too as well. I don't know, Kay, if you have any information on that too. But they, the, the thing about the fritillary butterflies and their conservation concern um, is because these violets that they're feeding on are typically only found at prairie or wetland remnant sites. Um, and so 
the way their life strategy works is, is that they really have trouble um, flying far distances and, and moving very far. So uh, when these prairies, you know, have become parceled out and, and there's long distances between patches of native prairie, they haven't been able to move between those areas. Um, so that's the biggest concern, um, you know, with, with the violets and, and not being able to, you know, just having a small patch of prairie and not being able to uh, move and, and, you know, grow their population beyond those confined borders. Okay, thank you, Sarah. We have time for just a couple of more questions. Um, and then after that, if you do have questions for Sarah and Kay, please do reach out to them. Um, they're a wealth of information, a five star, I would say. Um, from Mel, we have, are there prairie regions in the Eastern or Western US outside of the traditional tall and short grass prairie region? I'm sorry, did he say there was, are there other prairie regions? Is that what he said? Yeah, are there pra other prairie regions in the Eastern or Western US? Um, yeah, there, there are, you know, other than tall grass prairie, we've got the mid grass and short grass and um, sand sagebrush um, prairies and yeah, all types. Um, so yeah, wherever people are, um, they ought to be learning about their particular ecoregion and exactly you know what it takes to keep it um, keep the biodiversity for that particular region and um, no different than being in the tall grass prairie um, just learn where you are and and what it takes to keep the biodiversity there okay thank you Kay um, one more question. Anissa wants to know, does uh, Prairie Plains assist with smaller locations within the city to make an area for pollinators, um, planning how to go about and providing resources? Um, so we, we have uh, done some smaller pollinator or, um, you know, native plant garden um, orders before. We typically do work with, um, you know, larger restored sites. Um, and putting plugs into those. Um, but Kay, also you have, you sell plant plugs as well or, or the native plants too for sites like that, correct? Yes. Yes, we do. So we, yep, we would certainly both be a resource um, for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much to both of you. Um, again, I encourage you to reach out to both Sarah and Kay. I'll hand this back over to Amanda. If you will hold on for us, please, for a few moments, we have a survey for you. Thank you all so much for attending. Yes, yeah, so before we have you guys hop off, we're gonna put up on your screen just a quick poll. This poll just helps us you know, get some feedback on how we're doing and how we can better run these events in the future as we continue to host those. Um, so while that's up on your screen, I just want to take a second to thank Sarah and Kay again for taking some time out of your Tuesday night to join us and give us this wealth of knowledge and such great information. And as Rita has told you all, and as I will implore some more, there were plenty of questions that we didn't get to. So please feel free to send those questions either to Sarah or Kay, who both shot their uh website information up there during their um, presentations, or you can reach out to us here at Conservation Nebraska, and we can definitely help get you guys all in contact with each other. So thank you again for joining us. This was recorded. I saw a couple questions about that. So this will be available for you guys later on as well. Um, so you can rewatch to get anything you missed or share it out with someone who couldn't be here this evening. But thank you all for attending. Again, Sarah, Kay, thank you so much for being here. After you wrap up that survey that's on your screen, you can feel free to head out for the evening and enjoy the rest of your Tuesday night. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, audience. Have a great night, guys.